the notion that you could have criminal liability for getting it wrong is not some theoretical possibility. It's right there. When you put 1001 into the SEC or to government, you're making a clear statement, clear awareness that you sign this on pain of personal criminal liability. And absolutely real. Welcome to the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practice Group's podcast, All Things Investigations. Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practices Group represents many of the premier companies around the world, providing advice on issues spanning the full anti-corruption and compliance spectrum. In this podcast, host Tom Fox and members of the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Practice Group will highlight some of the key legal issues involved in white collar and other investigations, both domestically and internationally. We will tackle topical issues involved in investigations, as well as explore how companies can prevent and detect issues that arise in conducting investigations on a worldwide basis. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox back for another episode, and I'm thrilled today to have Kevin Abakoff back with me. Kevin, first of all, welcome this morning. Always a pleasure to be here. Kevin, we're going to take up something that you and I have both thought a lot about, and that is the process instituted in 2022 by the Department of Justice to require chief compliance officers to certify after the completion of a deferred prosecution agreement or other settlement in an FCPA and now other cases that a compliance program is, quote, reasonably designed to detect and prevent violations of the law. This was instituted via speech by Kevin Polite, and it has caused lots of consternation, certainly amongst our CCO brethren and sistren, but also in the wider compliance world as well. I think we both think this is perhaps a misplaced effort, and you have some pretty strong thoughts on it. So I'll hear yours, and then I'll tell you mine. So from the broadest, you know, the narrative around the initial determinant, because it is new, and we've seen it in Glencore, we've seen it a couple of times now, as you said, the narrative around it, and maybe that's the easiest place to start is an empowerment device for chief compliance officers and the notion that it'll help them get resources and frankly, the foundational place to begin. So I start with that as my opening. I think I've referred to it maybe with you as Orwellian. Perhaps the other part of that narrative is to give CCOs, quote, a seat at the table, end quote. That part is equally misplaced. If you don't have a seat at the table after you've gone through an FCPA enforcement action, I think there are a whole lot bigger problems. You and I have both been involved in these types of cases. I have not taken a company through an investigation. You have. I haven't taken a company through the remediation part. And that is the time when a company is most focused on a compliance program, I think it would be fair to say. Even after a resolution is signed and there's a probationary or deferred prosecution agreement period or even an NPA period, there's still a lot of focus at that time. Now, perhaps that changes you know, at the conclusion of a DPA, but we're not to that point yet. We're where someone has to sit on with their name down that they can certify it's reasonably designed. And looking at it from a CCO perspective, leaving the potential liability aside, I see that CCOs will now have to do everything during the deferred prosecution agreement period, meaning go beyond the last mile so that they can make that certification because a program has to be reasonably designed. Then you have to test it. And in that testing, if you find anything wanting, not unusual to find you need to enhance or remediate certain components of it, you're going to have to do that as well. I think the pressure on the CCO, I don't want to say to get it right, but go to extra mile, I think is increased. But there's now a potential liability. and. If I had been asked to be the Glencore CCO, I'm not sure that would have been something I would have wanted to take on to that potential liability. Or if we even go outside the FCPA world, Donska Bank, with a $2 billion fine for money laundering, they have a CCO certification for AML laws. We also saw that with Honeywell and ABB. So you play more in the white collar defense space. Do you see any potential liability for a CCO from something like this? I do. I 
I agree with everything you said. When you look at the particular language, of, which is a relatively short document, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm pretty sure I recall it, it reference to 1001 false statements. The notion that you could have criminal liability for getting it wrong is not some theoretical possibility. It's right there. When you put 1001 into the SEC or to government, you're making a clear statement, clear awareness that you sign this on pain of personal criminal liability. And absolutely real. I also think that the idea is going to be more focused. Having lived this drill from representing the company to being the monitor, you know, you name it, to TCOs couldn't be more focused. It's their, their whole job. Their scorecard is filled with personal achievement in addition to getting through in a successful way the monitorship. What this does, though, if you think about it, is that by making the CCOs pressure off the CEO and you take pressure off the board, and we'll come to the board, but you take pressure off the CEO because as they often have, you know, they're cascading sub-certification. Say, look, it was on top of this. If he or she was willing to sign, that would was where I know so much more about the detail of what we've done and whether it's effective or not tells me that I'm okay to sign. And so it takes pressure off the CEO, not what you want to do, because at the end of the day, they have the power over the person. And ironically enough, power when that monitorship, it's been my long held position that that's exactly the worst possible time for the company, vulnerable, because there's often and it shouldn't be an exhale. And maybe we could draw down resources. Maybe, you know, when we get crunched a little bit. And the irony of that is that it's going to be, you know, Monday morning quarterback at its finest, something will happen. And the Department of Justice will, well, you certified on Monday that your controls were effective. On Wednesday, you had your problem because we've now found out about it. How could you have gotten comfortable on Wednesday? It broke down so completely. It's exactly in that breakdown that somebody's going to have to defend him or herself. And it's going to be quite difficult. The thing that intrigued me the most about your thoughts on this and why I really was excited about this podcast is you have looked at a potential either new direction or solution or remediation of this requirement. And I really am excited to visit with you about this. And you take it to corporate governance, right up to the level of the board. So I want to turn it over to you and give us your thoughts on why this, you don't see this, or rather you see a solution here, but you see it as a corporate governance solution. I do, Tom. Not back to the reasoning behind it. The solution really to me, and it's practical governance, I think it's also consistent, is, is to put the responsibility, if you're going to have an enhanced certification beyond the CEO, it could be the whole board, it could be the audit committee of the board, it could be company has one to do compliance and ethics. Doesn't really matter, but the point being that it should be the board. If you look back, I think 1987 or so, you have the Caremark decision. Court, funny procedural posture, but it was the first real job by Delaware ending what people used to call the ostrich theory, that in the sand, what they didn't know couldn't hurt them. And Delaware Chancery Court said, not so fast, making sure there are systems in place management's responsible for implementing them, but you got to make sure they're a system. The guidelines for prosecutors were published, corporate compliance programs, they directly cite care marks. The DOJ is aware of long-held care mark in esteem as being the right way to think about of evaluating corporate compliance programs. And in fact, when you look at Monaco's statements, she references in September 15th to 22, she talks about her experience as a board member, motivating some of the changes. She doesn't talk about her compliance officers. It's really that, that experience as a board, which under where governance, where most companies are governed in the last couple hundred years, it's the board of directors. And so if you're going to really want to make sure companies properly reset, uh, you should put it in the hands of the people who not just nominally, but as a matter of law, that's the board of directors. So you see the board as, I don't want to say the conscience of a corporation, but certainly the group in a corporation that is tasked legally with oversight. 
They're not tasked with tactical decisions. They're not tasked with getting in the weeds. They're tasked with stepping back, looking at the entire picture of the company, and then guiding it in the direction they see fit. How does that really tie with what the DOJ seems to want here is for someone to have that oversight and to put their name on the line that, yes, this program is reasonably designed. And it just seems to me the board is better suited for that. Totally agree with that. And I would finish the thought that you is the corporate conscience by design. They are meant to be the stewards of the company. Ever since Burl and Means wrote in the Ninth Operation of Ownership and Control and the great problem associated with professional companies who aren't the sort of interested shareholders, at least not in the majority, they've looked to the board as being the thing that looks out for the increasingly you know, mom and pop shareholders through their mutual funds. I think they're out of the company. The other thing you said was we already have a legal requirement for boards and oversight and compliance. And that comes to us from, of course, the state of Delaware with the Caremark decision and now its progenies all the way up to probably the most recent was the Boeing decision. And the, the Caremark decision basically holds that whatever your risk is in your company, you need to assess and manage that risk from an oversight perspective at the board level. And it strikes me that if we wed this Department of Justice desire to have someone in that oversight function saying our program is reasonably designed to the requirements of Caremark, we could actually have a pretty powerful legal reasoning. And we have a doctrine in place, which it seems to me almost slides directly into it. If you look at the line of cases that emerges after Caremark, it basically says there's two ways you can be liable under a care in a Delaware proceeding. One is a complete absence of control. It's a case in the context of a monitorship. The other is a board's failure to red flags. Well, that's exactly what we're dealing with here, right? The red flag here, he's had a major investigation, presumably has found misconduct because that's why it's the red flag. And the board is the one under all these cases to talk about the board needing to make sure that there are adequate in place to respond to that red flag, which is exactly what we're dealing with, by contrast, is a tool in that process. And to me, officer responsible is really a cure in search of a problem. The suggestion to be that somehow chief compliance officers are not being forthcoming with the department, this in place to really get at them so they'll raise issues. I've just not heard that. I, frankly, in my career, I've not witnessed that. The kind of step into a company as the chief compliance officer in the midst of a monitorship or resoluting is not typically the kind of person who's shy about communicating with the Department of Justice. Usually you see are the classic oversharers. You know, they can't wait to tell without this requirement because they want to make sure that their reputation is intact. Requirement for the CCO to certify you know, again, it, it's a solution I don't think really exists. And really, it, to me, it smacks of what you sometimes for theory, you know, that you sometimes see that in coming from the government. You know, if you get at the accountants, the lawyers, the people who have sort of the last clear chance to stop misconduct, you'll get better behavior. If that's what they're really up to, then they don't think that that's really the answer here. But I really don't think there's a natural the solution and what the problem is they're trying to fix. Kevin, I and others have pointed to SOX, specifically SOX 404 certifications, as perhaps a model we can use. You don't find that model really appropriate in either the FCPA or, or other types of enforcement actions. I was wondering if you could give us your thoughts on why you don't think the SOX model really gives that much help. The SOX looks to the CEO and the CFO. I think that certainly it has the same sort of civil and criminal liability attached to it. It's not irrelevant. So I, I don't criticize you or anybody else who says it's an... In I just think that it, it emerged from a situation where, again, the problem you're trying to fix. And the problem was the builders had lost faith in the company and its stewards. And the idea was the CEO and the CFO certified shareholders will gain confidence that really paying integrity of the financial statements in a way that maybe people thought they were not prior to the fall of Enron and the whole debacle that came out of 2001. 
see that that's the problem we're really trying to cure here. The issue is I think they, they are maybe recognizing the limitations on monitorships, maybe some ability to assess controls. So they really want to make sure that the people, ones who are certifying and making sure that they're really engaging in and fulsome efforts to get those controls in place that are going to work for the long term place. Because I still think that's the great challenge. It may be the failing that happens after people exhale that ends up being certifications activated. One of the things I've observed in my 15 years in this area of the law is the Department of Justice seems to listen to commentators. They seem to listen to people like yourself, the white collar defense bar. They evolve in their own thinking as well. Is this something that you think we can perhaps continue to talk about, put forward new ideas and perhaps get some traction in moving this to a corporate governance issue as opposed to Mr. or Ms. CCO, you have to sign your name on the dotted line? I would hope so, Thomas, largely because we're not just saying get rid of this certification. It's putting too much pressure. I think we're coming forward, both of us, with good governance that's not taking the CCO out of it. We're giving them, I think, a better and better reasoned look for this certification. And I would hope that ups the logic in it. Kevin, I greatly appreciate you sharing your thoughts with me. I hope we can continue this conversation and perhaps jointly see if we can develop some ideas further. Thanks very much.